All right, everyone. How you doing today? Welcome. Good, you? Real good, thank you. Good. Well, good. Welcome to class two. Good. Good, good. Everybody's good and yakking away. Excellent. Welcome to class two of Audio MIDI One. Um, we've got a lot to cover today, a lot, and hopefully we can get through it all. Let me just uh, switch to my screen view here and let's take a look at a couple of things first. So I've got here our, for both of my classes, I've Mike started migrating all my materials up into this OneDrive that the college has through Microsoft. And this is not, I haven't figured out, had time to get the teams together. Um, and I think that the way that they're working it is that you have to use your college email address and some of you are not using that in order to access everything. But with this OneDrive here, if I send you the link, you can all access it. So I've sent you all the link for this particular folder. And if you haven't gotten it, let me send it to you again. So I'll copy that and I'm going to pop that in the chat. Just like that. All right, so what I would do now, if I, let's, so I'm using Chrome for this, and I've got it right up here, right on my bookmarks bar, whatever they call that. I can just click there, and I can go right to this, no problem, really quickly. So we've got Audio MIDI 1 Spring 2022. And if I click on this, there are now four folders. You'll have one for assignments. This is where you're going to upload your assignments. And this actually should be in here. Um, keep both. Okay, so that got copied into there. Right, so everybody, there's a lot in there, which is good. Um, yeah, so this is fine for now, but if I ask for something in a, in a PDF, hand it in in a PDF. I'll, you know, I can, I think I can read this on here without having to convert it. But I would have to then download it, then upload it to Google Documents, and then convert it into something I can read on there. Whereas a PDF, I can just down, I can just read it, and it's much easier. So you know, you're saving me a when I ask for something, pay attention to the details. All right, so it's fine. Don't worry about it today. Just going forward, because I won't read it the next time. I'll send it back and ask you to send it up as a PDF. So your next assignment is going to go into here. And then we've got class info in here, and we've got the syllabus, preferences, house rules, and instructions for licensing Pro Tools with the iLock Cloud if you need to see that. And then we've got class materials. So in here we've got class two, which is today. And I'm gonna come back to this folder in a second. And then we've got feedback. So in here, there will be folders, right? So like, for example, boom, I'll make a folder and then you'll find your feedback in here. Now for the blueprinting, I'm probably just gonna type it in to a uh, onto an email and send it to you. But typically I make like five, seven, eight minute feedback videos. They're like little private lessons. I do a screencast and I give you some suggestions. And what I like doing about, why I like doing that is I can customize my feedback to the level that you're at. So in other words, if you're a graduate student and you're capable of more than what the rest of the class, the undergraduates are, or, or, or other graduate students are, I'm going to give you feedback and show you different techniques and things that might be a little bit more difficult to do if you're an undergraduate and an MAP a minor uh, and you know your musical skill is not as developed don't please don't take that as an insult but you know it's not as developed as a graduate music student I'll give you smaller things to do as long as you do them well you'll be able to progress so I'll be able to tailor the feedback and this way I find that this is a good way for me to teach and then tailor a class to the individual talent levels well, not talent but just the development levels is better because you know if you work hard you can develop your talent right 
um, of each student. So there'll be feedback videos in general going forward for the assignments, and you'll find them there. So let's go into class materials for today. And a couple of things. Let me zoom in on this for you. And for those of you out in YouTube land that are watching this as I post this up there, th there's some stuff in Recording Studio Fundamentals and Audio MIDI 1 that overlap. Uh, but Audio MIDI 1 will get much, much deeper into MIDI than Recording Studio Fundamentals does. But this is still the beginning of the semester. Okay, so this is where your link for your master class folder. It tells you all about this. Now, if you are down, if you've downloaded, if you've gotten Pro Tools from Justin, our school version, if you've signed that out for the semester, then he's given you access to all the things you need to download to be able to complete the assignments for the class. But if you are subscribing to Pro Tools, and let me just show you what you need to download and install to work for the class. So I've got stuff blacked out on here that's personal information. So you won't, you'll see boxes like this throughout the, this presentation. So you've got your account. And then right here, you, you know, you'll, you'll sign in and you'll, you'll navigate to the My Account. You'll see something that says View My Products. You'll click on that and open that up. But first, before you do that, go to the bottom of the page and make sure your iLock account, you'll have to go to iLock.com and set up an account and download, probably download the iLock software manager, but that's in that other PDF. And if you've got an issue with that, just email Justin. He can teach you how to walk you through that. So make sure that this email address that's, that I've got blacked out here is matches your iLock account email address. Then below that, you'll see uh, My Products. You'll click on that. And it'll bring you to this page. This is a little foggy because, you know, I'm zooming way in, but you should be able to see that. But you'll have, it'll tell you what you have right here with all of your system ID, your iLock ID, and your billing information right here. Okay? And then when you click on, someone should turn off their microphone, please. Click on your Pro Tools Annual Upgrade and Support tab, which will open up to this. Right? This blue thing right here. And the things that you need to download have an X after them. So the Pro Tools 2021 installer, and please just get the plain Pro Tools. Do not get Pro Tools HD. You guys have no use for that at all. So uh, Pro Tools 2112 installer, or whatever the highest number is here, because they may, like you could, you know, there, there may be a couple of numbers depending upon where you've gotten, but the one with the highest number you download that and install it. And I have a Mac. They've got a tab for Windows if you've got a Windows computer. So that, you install that. You don't have to worry about the hardware driver. You don't have to worry about the Loop Master sample pack. If you want to download that, you can download it. But then, you know, you've got something that's 1.53 gigabytes of data. You, can, you know, if you want to download that and then put it up in the cloud for you to access, these are some cool loops that you could use in your own compositions. You don't have to worry about Pro Tools Legacy, none of that. So the Pro Tools plugins that you're going to install. So you're going to install whichever one of, when it says first Air Instruments, you want to install the Air Instruments bundle. Notice there's two of them here. I've got them both checked, right? Pick the Air Instruments bundle with the highest version number. So you could see this one has 2018.3 and this is 19.12, right? 19, you know, is... is it's up at the top. This is the one you want to get, the one that's the highest number. Don't worry about the decade, the, the century. Just this is the year and the ver the update number. So this is the one that you want to install. You, The 11 effects bundle, you can't, you don't have to worry about installing that. You can if you want. You do want the air first effects bundle. And most importantly, you want expand to. So, Install all of these, but for the air instruments, take the one that's the highest number. 19 is higher than 18. Very simple. So download and install those into your computer. 
And then there's here, right here at the bottom, these are Pro Tools Basics Videos short form. So these are between six and 10 minutes long. This will take you right to the playlist. And I did this in 2018, I believe, but it's all still relevant for today. So we're gonna go through a lot of this stuff, but like, let's say you wanna look at how to set up the, the toolbar, right? You can get it here. I may have changed a few things since then, but the basic ideas are still still relevant. So you can go there and this is six minutes and 36 seconds, five minutes and five seconds, six minutes and 56 seconds. You know, they're, they're short. They're under 10 minutes long. And then, you know, there are longer tutorials in here uh, and more advanced stuff. So there's a lot. This whole playlist here has a lot of instructional videos, all sorts of stuff. Anyway, uh, that's that stuff there. Okay. Any questions on any of that? No? All right, good. So we're gonna get into setting up Pro Tools and working and today. And, um, but what I like to do every class is show you something, whoops. Oh, there we go. Okay. You know, I got this set up to zoom in and out um, by holding the control key and then scroll wheel. And I always have to remember to zoom back out once I've zoomed in. Otherwise, the screen looks a little odd. So uh, I do that so that you guys can see because right now, if I were to start teaching and you were looking at the screen and I wanted to get detailed, you wouldn't be able to see it on your laptops. But I can zoom way in and you guys can get a really good look at this. Even if it is just a little bit blurry, it's still pretty, it's much It's much more useful. And then when I get back into in-person teaching, I'm gonna have this in, set up on the in the lab on all the computers so that I can do that. All right, so what I wanna do here for this part of the class is I wanna spend maybe half an hour or 40 minutes and I wanna show you the possible, what's possible and what to strive for. So one of the benefits of me teaching this class online is that I have access to my computer with all of my projects in it set up the way I want. And I can't do this in the school computers because we don't have the software and they're not powerful enough to do uh, some of the stuff I do. Hopefully one will be able to upgrade soon to some of the newer Macs, the M1 iMacs when those come out and those are very, those will be very powerful, but we still won't have all the stuff that I've got installed in my computer. But I want to give you an idea of, you know, what to shoot for with MIDI going forward as far as compositional. And remember, I'm going to show you something that's very sophisticated MIDI wise. And the general remark is that Pro Tools MIDI is not good. That's not true. It's very good. Uh, Logic and Cubase and Digital Performer have more advanced functionality, but as I'm a keyboard player, I don't need a lot of that. Um, but I've scored a hundred, probably close to 90, I've scored over 100 films in my life and probably 90 of them I've scored in Pro Tools with MIDI. Um, so, you know, I don't know. It is what it is. So let me play this for you. This is a cue, this is the, uh, a, an, a, a rough mix, it's a good mix, but not perfect, of a cue that I wrote for a film. It's the opening of a film I scored for ESPN last, the, in 2020, the fall of 2020. And it's called um, Once Upon a Comeback. And let me, so let me play it. And then there'll be a few spots where you'll just hear some wood clicks there's something going on on screen that I'm following there, but you'll get an idea of this. So there's a lot of sections, there's a lot of changes, there's tempo changes, there's markers, there's meter changes, there's stylistic changes. Nothing's very complex musically, but there's a lot going on here. And I just want to show you what, what you can do with some of this MIDI stuff. And this isn't even the most sophisticated MIDI piece I've written, but it's, it's, an, it's enough to handle for like a half an hour breakdown. Some of the other ones would take me an hour to go through. So let's take a listen and I'll catch you on the other side.
Okay, so that's a good cue. It, it came out well. My clients liked it. So let's go through this. And I'll, in addition to breaking down the cue, I'm going to go through uh, like what the different areas of Pro Tools are. And then when we start working for some of the lesson for today, there's more stuff I want to show you in terms of setup. So on the top level of Pro, this is the edit page. This is where all the action is. Pro Tools has another page called the Mix page, right? Which looks like this. This is a, a software representation of a hardware mixer. And I keep this open on a separate window. I don't use this as much because I'm not an audio engineer. I'm a composer. Audio engineers that use this when they work, they're used to using a console, a, a, a recording desk. And this looks and acts just like a recording desk. And just remember, every software has something that looks like this, right? Whether it's Cubase or whether it's Logic or Reaper, Studio One, they all have something, a mixing desk and an arrange slash edit page. They just have different names for it. And on all of the software on the top line, that'll be sort of like your toolbar, right? So, but I'm just gonna be specific with Pro Tools. So let me zoom in a little bit so you can see this a little bit better. And let me drag this over here. So going, so the toolbar is this top area here that goes all the way from the left to the right. And in this area here, these are your edit modes, right? So this first one is shuffle, which is red, slip, which is green, spot, which is yellow, and grid, which is blue. Now notice grid has a little something extra that the other four don't have. It has a little downward facing triangle. And you'll notice in just from what you can see up here, there are a lot of triangles. When you see triangles and arrows, that means that when you click on those, it will give you additional functionality or an additional menu underneath. So you'll see those all over the place. So for example, if I click here with grid, it will change it to what's called relative grid. We will get into that later in the semester, but what I wanna do when I'm showing you this stuff is only show you the bits you need to get through the assignment that you're gonna be assigned. There is so much, there's so much deep stuff inside of every one of these DAWs. I don't know anybody who knows everything. I've been working with Pro Tools for 20 years. I don't know everything about Pro Tools. I know everything I need to know to work. That being said, I'm always trying to learn more to make my workflow better. So I can work any kind of project that comes my way now, but there are, there's more advanced functionality that as I learn it, it makes my life easier. And I've actually had students show me a few things that they've discovered that I hadn't, I didn't know, you know, so it, it, you always are learning with this thing. Okay. So these are the edit modes. We'll get into those, but for you guys, you'll always, for the first couple of projects, you will always keep it on the blue grid, not the purple relative grid. Just click on it and changes it. Okay. 
These are right here are your zoom controls and these right here are memory zoom locations. We're not going to be using these at all. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you how to hide them, right? These are your tools right here. Don't worry about this bottom line here. We'll get into some of this later on in the semester. These are your tools. This is your zoom tool. This is your trimmer. This is your selector. This is your grabber. And you notice how when I hover over something, a little rectangle shows up with the information. I'll show you how to set that up so that you can get that happening too. I leave it that way. It's very helpful, even for me at my advanced age and uh, amount of time I've been doing this. This is the scrubber tool and this is the pencil tool. If you click, notice that there's a bracket around these three tools here. If you click here, that makes the smart tool, right? We're not going to use that. That gets confusing, but I just wanted to show it to you. So I'm going to click on one of these and you'll notice that the trim tool and the grabber tool have other modes. We're going to use the TCE later in the semester, but for right now, make sure it's on the standard mode. And I'm getting that by right clicking on it. And the same with the grabber tool. Do not worry about separation or object. Just keep it on time. And then the pencil tool, we're going to start off the semester just using the line, which is the second option. We, I will show you as the semester progresses the freehand, the triangle, the square, and the random. The parabolic and the S-curve, we're probably not going to use those. Those have to do with audio editing, and we're not going to do the kind of audio editing that needs those. But we will certainly be using random, square, triangle, line, line and freehand as the semester goes on. But I want you guys to leave it set up for line. Okay. Now, this little bit to the neck, to the right of that, this is your big, your main counter right? And the counter counts time. So there's a lot of stuff here. Let's not worry about this for now. Notice that I've got, there's two right here. There's the main counter and the sub counter. The main counter is set up in bars, beats, and these three zeros, those are called ticks. They're not the little annoying bugs that give you Lyme's disease. They're ticks as in ticks of a clock, right? We will, I will explain that in a, in a next week probably uh, in really good detail, but right now just bars, beats, and ticks. Ticks are equivalent to subdivisions of the beat. They are what happened, they're eighth notes, 16th notes, 32nd notes, uh, and triplets, the whole, the whole gamut. You can find them inside the ticks. This, I have it set up for the sub counter, and this is set up for SMPTE time code, which is what I use when I'm scoring films. You can notice how the main counter has a triangle right here. So if you click on this, it has something called hide sub counter. So I can just get rid of that. And then we've just, this is what you'll use right now for our semester. And you can change the time base, right? So you can click on this and you can make it minutes and seconds. You can make it time code. You, and you, you guys will probably never use feet and frames or samples, but you can certainly set it for that. But for our class, we're gonna use bars and beats. And then this here gives you the, like the edit selection. So notice how I just clicked here in this area and it's telling you where I start and where I end and the length of the selection here. So that's the edit selection. Okay, so this is the counter, bars, beats, and then ticks, or which is the subdivisions. Then this box here, this is your grid selector. And I'll show you the grid later. You want to make sure that this is on. We're going to work with the grid for the for, for this semester. In Audio MIDI 2, we, we, we turn the grid off. We turn the grid off. Not always, but we do turn the grid off. But for this semester, I want you to work with the grid. So we're going to turn the grid on. This tells you that the grid is set to a quarter note. You can change the grid resolution right here. So if you click on this, you get different note values. You can make it dotted, triplet, and 
I can set my grid up to be minutes and seconds, time code, all of these things, right? It's very, it's very versatile. So I can make it be a um, whole note. Then this right here, this is your, these are your MIDI controls. Gives you the count off. We're going to be using that, your meter, your tempo, and then down here, you've got wait for note MIDI. I used to use this, but it doesn't work anymore. It's bugged out. So I use count off instead. And this turns your click track on and off. This is called MIDI merge. We will learn this later in the semester, but keep it off. And this is our conductor track. It turns our click, our, our conductor. We can have our tempo change every fraction of a beat if we want. And I will show you that this semester. But basically, this is how you're going to want to have it set up. You're going to want the metronome on, and you're going to want the conductor track on. Now, let me zoom out a little bit because I want to show you, and I'm going to go over this again later but because I find repetition really helps. But let me show you how to set up the conductor track. So it's you got it blue, so it's activated. If you double-click on it, it brings up the click count off options here. And what you want to do is not worry about this right here because you're going to insert a click track. But right here, you want to have this set up so that it only clicks during record. Only clicks during record. You don't want to hear the click track when something is playing back. It's annoying. It's, it's really annoying. And then at the bottom of this, you have your count off and only during record, right? You can have a two bar count off, a one bar count off that you set up for yourself. And we'll go over that um, later on in the class in a little bit more detail. These, this is your uh, synchronization. I don't really need to see that. And I'm going to show you how to customize this in a minute. And this is your output meter. This gives you a basic, very general look at what the level is coming out of your computer and whether you are um, distorting or not, if it's up in the red or it's too hot. But it's just, a, a it's general. It's not really... 100% functional because there's no numbers. You're just looking at a picture, not of something that's giving you an exact readout. So if we look over here, and let me zoom in on this, you'll see that there is a triangle inside of a circle. So we know that triangles mean pull-down menus. And right here, we can choose what to see and what not to see. So before there was no transport. So let me zoom out again and watch what happens over in this area here when I turn the transport on. I'm going to click on transport and now this magically shows up which is the transport. We do not need to use this. We will be using this. I will teach you to use this. We definitely use this in Audio MIDI 2 when we're recording live audio. I will teach you how to, the basics of using this later on in the semester, but for right now, we do not need to see this. So we turn it off, and you guys do not need to see the zoom controls. Let's zoom back out on here, but this, this box right here, this, this rectangle, this area here, you don't need to see that. And so you're mostly using laptops, right? So if I click here, and we don't need to see this synchronization here. So... Uh, synchronization, turn that off. You've just saved all of this space in your toolbar and that should be able to fit on your laptop very comfortably. This is really all you need to see in the toolbar. Okay. Any, que any questions on that so far? I'm going to definitely go over this again today, but this is an introduction to this. You really need to know, you know, the, how do you learn a piece of software? You learn a piece of software multiple ways. But one of the first things you should do is to look around the GUI, which is the graphic user, user interface, and learn, look and see what's available, how, what is, what is, what, how it's broken up, what the sections are, and what each section does, and how you can customize that section to fit your workflow. I want to show you guys things, a couple of things during the semester that will help your workflow, right? So one is that you're working on a laptop. So knowing how to customize what you see on the laptop 
for the particular project you're working on will give you more screen space, right? When you're mixing, you may want to see things that you don't need to see when you're just working in MIDI. So you can, you can quickly show things, put them away. And the other thing that I want to show you all is the best way today, the most useful way today for inputting data into MIDI data into any kind of sequence or DAW is through a MIDI piano key type keyboard with white notes and black notes. There are alternative controllers. There are things like Ableton Push, things with pads on them. Um, those are all great, but the majority of things that you use are piano keyboard based. So if you're going to do this work, you need to have some keyboard skills. Um, it's my job to show you ways to enter notes to make it sound like you've got better keyboard skills than you actually do. And there are definitely tricks, tips, techniques, right? And it's not cheating. It's not cheating at all. You know, it's... What you want to do is get the material in to Pro Tools, the data, and then you want to paint with the, the data that's in there. You want to sculpt. You want to create the music. It's like a, you put a piece of clay on a wheel and it's going round and round and round. It's just a blob of clay. And you sculpt it with your hands and your tools and fingers. You know, Jackson Pollock is dancing over a canvas with, you know, with a cans of paint and dropping it down and filling up his paintbrush and throwing paint against the canvas and, you know, and he's, he sees what's there and then he re-manipulates and he moves things around, right? It's, you know, you think, well, how come he's not with the brush, you know, drawing something then painting it and, and doing that? Well, that's, he's figuring out a different way to be creative. And so that's one of the great things about music technology is that it is the great democratizer, right? It makes things available to people that, normally would not be available to them. The bad side of that is people with very little creativity and musical foresight. Doesn't, you don't have to be trained, you know. Um, Jimi Hendrix couldn't read music, right? Just always remember that. But Jimi Hendrix was a genius, right? He, he was amazing. Um, but a lot of guitarists can play one or two chords and they go out to try to create music on that. And unless they're Jimi Hendrix, it doesn't work most of the time. Uh, unless they're Kurt Cobain, it doesn't work. So it's not cheating. It's just you're using the tools there to achieve your end result. Okay? All right. So... You'll also notice that on the top bar will be the name of your session. So you'll always be able to tell what you're working on by looking on this top bar here. That's kind of cool. Now, the next section down, which is right here, these are your rulers. And rulers measure thing. It's not like a king ruler, but it's, it's like a, 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 a tape measure or something like that. So if we go over to this far left-hand side, we'll see these are different rulers, right? So the bar beat, time code, tempo, meter, key, and markers. And this can be customized. So for example, if I click right here on this triangle, I don't need to see time code because I, I typically have time code up there. So again, I've gained some space. I don't need to see the key, but I can see that it also has chords. You won't the only thing that you might want to have is minutes and seconds on yours. You don't need to have time, any of these four. And for right now, you don't need key. I will show you how to change, enter key signatures. I will show you how to enter chord uh, symbols on the timeline this semester. But for right now, just these five bars and beats, possibly minutes and seconds, but markers, tempo, and meter. That's a good thing. Okay, so that's this area here. And then... If we look in this area here, this is our timeline, right? 
and this is where all the action happens. It reads like a book from left to right. And this is earlier in the piece. And then over here, this is later in the piece, in this area here. Right? This is later in the piece. Earlier. Oops, sorry. There we go. Later. And the end. So it travels left to right. It reads like a book. So let's zoom in on to our timeline again. I mean our rulers area. And up here on the top, whoops, right in this area here, this is our bars and beats, right? So let me just, hold on a second. So you could see it's one, three, five, seven, nine, 11. If I get closer, right, I can, now it's every bar. And then right here, the second line, this is our minutes and seconds. I've got that set up here. This greenish line here, you could see that's our tempo. This, we start out at 60 beats per minute, 59.3. 70, all the way to the end. Right here, this bluish gray one, this is our t uh, meters. So we start out in 4, 4, 3, 8, 4, 4. Right here, we got 9, 8, 2, 4, 4, 4, 5, 4, 4, 4, right? I, I have to do that stuff sometimes to get this to fit to the picture. And then this one here with multicolors, with all the text, these are what Pro Tools call, this says markers on here, but they're also known as memory locations. And we will go over these, but not, we don't need to know these right now, but you can see that this gives me an overview of what's happening on the screen as I was scoring this, right? I, I put these all in so I knew what my structure was. And you'll put these into yours just to demark the different sections of what you're working on. But you're not going to have to worry about those yet. But I just wanted to show you those. And then over here, this area here, these are all our tracks. And they can be resized. Right? I'm just, and I'll show you this key command very easily. Actually, let me do this. Right, so I'm holding down these two keys here and I'm hitting the up arrow and they get bigger and the down arrow, they get smaller. So that's kind of cool. And let's zoom in on one of those and we can take a closer look at it. So this is our track name and then there's a bunch of stuff down here. This is our track view. For the we, We're just going to leave these as they default to clips, okay? Don't worry about that yet, but you do need to know the name. And right here, these three buttons. The first one is Record Enable, right? So if you click on this, which I'm going to do right now, it will start blinking red. See that? Boom. The next one is S for Solo and M for Mute. We will go over those. The next... So this is an instrument track, and the neck, this is the instrument that I'm using. Right here, this column is the inserts. I've inserted an instrument called contact in there. This is my sends column. We're not going to worry about that now. About the seventh or eighth week of the semester, we'll be getting into that. And this is my output. Okay? And then you'll notice that I've only got flute right here in this whole piece, I think. Yeah. This little bit right here, this blue, bluish bit here, that is called a clip, all right? That's got data in it. And all of those things here, those are MIDI notes. And I will show you the MIDI editor later today. Now, you'll notice that I've got this track organized, not like an orchestral score, but kind of like an orchestral score. And that's sort of how I tend to organize these, this kind of music. So I will, this is very important to me is how you organize your sessions. So you'll look and I've got flute, I've got short oboe, long oboe, and bassoon. And then I've got something called the Kepler winds. And then I've got 
these pink ones, these are vocals, vocal ah, vocal ooh, Celtic vox. And then I've got sort of distant murmurs. This is kind of a synth sound. Then I've got my piano sounds right here. And then some other oddity, odd instruments. And then right here, got drums, percussion. And then right in this area here, I've got guitar, bass. And then down here, I've got all my strings. And then I've got some unused tracks, which I can hide, and I'll show you how to do this. And then these red ones, these are audio tracks that I've got wood blocks on. And then there's a sub subgroup. These are all my submasters. These are AUGs inputs. We will learn these later in the semester. All of those MIDI tracks are all grouped. So all the winds are routed to this submaster here. The drum kits are all routed to this here, and I'll show you this in a second, but we'll go over this later on. This is a folder for all my effects. So I've got all my, my reverbs down here and uh, delay. And then the music all gets routed through this subgroup here, this uh, uh, aux input here, and that's my music master. Now, So let's say that I'm playing this right here. And I want to hear the vocals. I can just hit this S. Now, if I want to hear the vocals in one of the pianos, if I want to hear the flute, which is right here, So you can solo all these. It works out really well. Now, these are all MIDI tracks. This right here is an audio track. Uh, give me one second. Yep, okay, great. And let me make that bigger. Let me solo that and let me zoom in on this. And this right here, this is this big, big bit here, that's a clip. But right in here, these little bits here, these are waveforms. And you can zoom in way far on these and you could see how they, they vary over time. And there's a lot of data there. There's amplitude and vibrations per second. And that all gets together. Um, and it also the kind of harmonic content that's in the sound. And so that's a waveform. And if I highlighted that, that and soloed this, this is just one little bit. Right? This is another bit. A lot of reverb. So now down here, all of these orange ones, these are wood blocks that I recorded, right? These are just some audio. This is for, a, uh, and I recorded a bunch of them here and I can, this, this purple track right here is called the VCA Master, and I've got all of these red ones, and we're going to go over this later on in the semester. I'm showing you what's possible, right? I've got these all grouped to this VCA Master so I could solo all of them. And basically what I did was there was a bunch of, there were a bunch of rapid picture changes. Boom, boom, hard cuts. And I just placed all of the audio wave starts, the attacks, the transients, to coincide with the picture change. And this is what it came up with. So I just recorded that as audio and then placed it there and then consolidated everything. Now, in this next section here where the rhythm section comes in, oh, hold on a second, let's turn that off. Let's just well, 
what's going on there, right? It's weird because we're, we're hearing more sound than there are MIDI notes. Well, I've got that going through. Right, you can see, if I zoom in on that, whoops, excuse me. Right, if I, this is something that I've inserted in the audio path, it's a delay, it's an echo. And if I turn this on, it adds rhythm, right? So we're going to learn how to do stuff like that towards the end of the semester, for sure. Yeah. So now right here in this section here, let's take a look at the time signatures here. So we're going along in 4-4. Four, four. So a measure of 9-8 here, a measure of 2-4, and then back in. So basically, it's a measure of 4-4 four, four with an added eighth note. It's not 9-8 like 1-2-3, 2-2-3, 3-2-3. Two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three. It's 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and, and 1, right? That's sort of what's going on there. I had to add an extra eighth note in there. And basically, from where this bit started to where this bit started over here, it was six beats and an eighth note. So... I I decided to break that up to one, two, two, and three, and four, and and one, and two, and one, right? So basically one and two and three and four and and one and two and one, basically like that. So you can do all these very sophisticated uh, time signature changes. You can change time signature every measure. You can create any kind of time signature you want, pretty much. And every DAW does that. All right, so that's an overview of something that's very sophisticated. There's more stuff to show you in this session, but I want to make sure that we get through everything we need to to get ready for the assignment for next week. Any questions on that? Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, it might be a little bit off topic, but that, that plug-in that you used for the delay, is that part of Pro Tools? No, or is that a nope. It's a third, yeah, I was going to say that, that's an extra thing. Yeah. Third party. But Pro, Pro Tools has a delay that we're going to be using that, that I actually I use. It's the mod, del cool. mod delay. It's, it's, it's very functional. Um, you can do a lot with it, and you can learn all the basics of using a delay. Uh, yeah, with that, no problem. It's, it's very functional. The reverb that comes with Pro Tools, I'm not a big fan of, but the delay works very well, and the EQs that come with Pro Tools, they're perfectly fine. Um, and we're just only going to start to touch on EQ in this semester. I'll teach you some basic uh, techniques with that. All right. So now let me show you another something here. One more setup thing here. So if we look in this upper right-hand corner, you'll see something that says A. I'm going to show you a couple of more things. Right here, do you see that says Edit Keyboard Focus? Make sure that that's clicked on so that it's amber. And what that does is that enables a whole world of control from the keyboard. So what do I mean by that? Well, the first thing I can show you is that by using the R key and the T key, I can zoom in and out on the timeline. And I can hold it, right? And I can just hold it down, it'll zoom. So that's very useful, just having one, one key for that. And there's a bunch of other one key functions that work really well if you have edit keyboard focus enabled. The other thing is that you'll notice that on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, there are these white areas. There's three of them. And you can resize those. Let me show you how to do that by zooming in. By hovering your mouse over the border, and you see how the arrow, the the 
arrow, the cursor changes to a cross. If you click and drag, you can open that way up. And then these are our lists. I think in Logic, they're called a media bin, media bin, stuff like that. But in Pro Tools, they're called lists. And these are in all of the tracks that we have. You'll notice that they're in the same order as you've got your tracks here. Let me show you, uh, and this show you all of the uh, hieroglyphics there and what they mean. So going from left to right, when this dot is clicked, that means you'll see it here. So let me make this flute bigger. And then I'm going to click on this dot. This flute track will disappear. See that? If I want to see it again, boom. Now notice there's a gray line across here. That's highlighted. That is highlighted because this is white. If I hold the Option key down and click on this, then that's no longer highlighted. Then the next column shows you the color of the track. You see it's that dark, rich blue or purple, whatever that is, that aligns to here. This right here tells you the kind of track. So you'll see the orange looks like a little keyboard with two black keys. That lets you know it's an instrument track. Right here, where it says keplerwinds.cm, that's a waveform. That lets you know that it's an audio waveform. Right? So if I scroll down, industrial hit, that's waveforms. Hold on a second, let me. And then down here, right? This little triangle here lets you know that it's a folder track and you can click on that and it'll open and close the folder. And inside the folder are all of these time-based effects. And the downward facing a trying an arrow like that lets you know that that is an augs input. All right. So that's the clips lists. And down here, we've got something called groups. And again, you can move this by hovering along the border and dragging up. These are our groups. We will get into groups later on, but I've only got a few groups in here. I tend to have a lot of groups sometimes. And then over here on the far left, this is our clips list. So this is a list of all the clips that is in the piece. And you will see that some of them are highlighted and some of them aren't. The ones that are highlighted are the ones that are actually visible inside of the session. The other ones are not visible, but they are accessible to you. So for example, This is our shaker track right here. Let me make that bigger, right? If I click on this, oh, see, it lets you know that this one is visible, but this one's not. So I can just drag this in here and I get that, I get that there, right? So and what I meant to say is that this, this dark one um, is the parent one. It's the first one that was recorded and then all of these are edited versions. So let me just see something here. Okay, so that's our clips list. So those are our lists, our three lists in Pro Tools. So this is our edit window. That's an overview. This is an overview of what you can do, um, very sophisticated work that you can perform inside of Pro Tools with MIDI. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff in here. We'll get to, we'll get to a fair amount of this, not to everything. Got to save stuff for Audio MIDI too and got to save stuff for you to go out and learn on your own. <laughs>
disk utilities, and then I've got Zoom, my software for my switcher, OBS, which I'm recording this class on, ScreenFlow, et cetera, and just other things over here. So I just have it on my dock and I can access it. And I will click on this. Actually, let me quit Pro Tools. Give it a second to quit. So I double click on that, it will start to boot up. Okay, please do that. See how it's bouncing right now? Everybody knows that. And you'll start to see the splash screen in a second. And what's happening now is that Pro Tools is loading in plugins. And your first time through, this may take a while. Initializing audio engine. Now, this is your dashboard. What I want you to do is go, uh, is let's, can't, I'm going to cancel this out. And I want to go to the setup and I'm going to select the playback engine. Give me one second here. It's something I have to move so I can see the top of my screen. Okay, great. So this is your playback engine. And you were to, you might say Pro Tools aggregate. You want to have your MacBook speakers, your whatever your internal audio is. We're not using an audio interface this semester. We're not recording audio. We're going to work with audio, but pre-recorded audio. Recording audio is the province of Audio MIDI 2. Um, yeah, and the end of Recording Studio Fundamentals, since that's more of a survey class. So you want to select your internal speakers. If you do have a audio interface and you're working with it, you select your audio interface right there, and then you work just like you did on whatever other software you've done. This is your buffer setting. You guys should probably start with 128 samples, see if you can work. If not, set it up to 256. I've got a pretty you know heavy-duty computer here so I can keep it down here. Don't worry about all of this stuff here. Just, you know, set it up at either 128 and if you get weird audio artifacts, come back here and move it to 256 samples. Now, when you set this up and you click OK, it may want to boot Pro Tools up again. That's fine. I've set mine up with my audio interface that I'm using for this class, which is right on my desktop. It's uh, it's this right here. I have a, when I'm home, I use a I use an HD interface, which is much better. Uh, but this works perfectly well for what I'm doing for, for most things. It's actually a good interface. So let's go back here. Okay, so you select your, before you do anything, you know, you close out of that um, dashboard, you just hit cancel, you go to setup, you go to playback engine, you set your playback engine up, you change your, make sure your buffer setting is at like either 128 or 256, and then you hit OK. It may ask you, it may want to reboot Pro Tools or quit Pro Tools, and then you have to relaunch it. That's not a problem. That's normal. If you change audio engines, Pro Tools needs to reboot. I don't know why they haven't gotten it so that you could change audio engines on the fly like you can in Logic or Cubase, but this is Pro Tools, so just so that you know that. Okay, so to create a session, uh, you want to do Command, Shift, and N like Nancy, right? Command, Shift, N. Oh, ah, I told you the wrong thing. Excuse me, that's a new track. See, I get confused with all this stuff. I'm talking and my brain gets fried. Okay, so let me do that again. <laughs> I apologize. So, okay, Command, N like Nancy. Okay, and then let's go to the split screen. Command N, and that brings up your dashboard. Uh, it's out in the sun too long today. Okay, so this is where you this is the dashboard. For right now, we're only going to, there's three pages, right? For right now, we're just going to stay on the create page. You've got your name, so far, it's untitled. We'll title this in a second. You've got, make sure that you're set for local storage. Don't worry about this middle area for now. And I realize I went over some of this last week, but it needs to be gone over and over until you get it internally. Now, 
Okay, there we go. Now let me get zoom way in. Okay, so right here you have your file type. We are going to be working with this file type, bwf.wave. If you click here, it gives you the option of AIFF. There's nothing wrong. They both sound the same. I'm just making a choice. We're working with wave. Our bit depth, you've got three options here. 32-bit float sounds better, but 24-bit sounds great. We're going to use that. 16-bit is no longer relevant, um, even though you have, if you want to make CDs, it's 16-bit, but we're working digitally, so 24-bit. And you want to make sure that interleaved is checked. That's for the type of stereo audio files you have. Then over here, we have our sample rate. I've got this set for 48K because that's film and television. You want to set yours to 44.1. This is fine, last used. So 44.1, IO settings are last used. In this area here, you'll see prompt for location. Yours may boot up with the location set to your documents folder. It's set here up for the desktop. But what I want to do is prompt for location. And make sure that this shows on startup. And then I need to name my session. And we have a naming convention, right? So I'm going to name mine the session for what the first assignment is going to be. Today's date, which I believe is the, um, is it the 10th or the 9th? 10th, yes, I got that right. And my initials. That's our naming convention. And then I'm going to hit create. Now, before we save the session, I want to show you something over here. You see that I've got my Macintosh hard drive, which has all my applications. Then I've got, a, I've got three internal drives besides the hard drive and an external drive that I've just got plugged in because I was looking for something earlier. I've got a project drive that has all my projects in it, right? And these are projects, some of these projects I've had have been in here for years. Uh, I transferred them from another folder, from another computer. I've got all this stuff backed up and that's another thing that I'm going to talk about. Um, and then down here is my sample drive that has all my sample libraries that I write with. And I've got, um, this is an eight terabyte drive, which is almost full. And then this is another eight terabyte drive. So there's like, I've got about 11 terabytes worth of samples here and probably at home in other hard drives that I access rarely, but I still ha keep them. I probably have another seven or eight terabytes worth of samples, but I don't use them as often so they don't get into my system. I can easily access them. Um, it's just a matter of putting a, plugging a cable in. So the proper way to work is to have an external drive. Your, all your projects go on the external drive and your application runs from the internal drive. You guys don't need to have that for what we're doing in class. It's perfectly fine if all you have is your your heart, your your Macintosh hard drive or whatever hard drive you have if you've got a PC. There's no problem with that for what we're going to be doing in our class. But I just want to show you what the really the right way to work. So eventually, if you go into this and you really want to get into this, you should need to buy an external hard drive and keep all your projects in that. And if you you need to have at least USB 3 to make those work well. And uh, I have um, USB-C and Thunderbolt 3 on my computer so I can run external SSD drives perfectly well and there's you don't really notice the difference in um, uh, in speed okay so let's get back here so what we're gonna do is your computer may open up like this right so what we want to do is click on this little guy here which opens up and I'm gonna navigate to my desktop and I want you guys to create a new folder. I did go over this last week and call this something like AM1 uh, Projects. You could, and if you want to write Spring 22, that's fine. All of your work is going to live inside of this project. And what I want you to do, I'm going to show you something. 
uh, because you need to back up your work. Your work needs to be in three places to be saved digitally. So I'll get into that in a second, but I'm going to store our session inside of that folder and I'm going to hit save. Did it boot? Let's see one more time. Uh, it's the first time it's froze on me since I've been teaching down here. Okay, so let's do it one more time. I'm going to hit create and I'm going to navigate to my desktop to here. And okay, it made my mic mute for a second. This is and this is how Pro Tools will boot up. You might not have a click track in yours, but I'll show you how to set that up in a second. But before we get anywhere, what I want to do is I want to show you the structure of the Pro Tools session. So this is our projects folder right here. Inside the projects folder is the project. And this folder is called the session folder, the Pro Tools session folder. Very important to remember that because when you open this up, there are a series of subfolders and something else that has the same name as your session folder, but it also contains a .ptx extension. And that is the session file. That is distinctly different from the session folder. The session folder is the parent container that has all of the assets ordered in a way that Pro Tools needs in order for Pro Tools to run effectively. If you do not understand this file structure, you will be running into problems as your sessions get more complex and you add things like audio files and video files and all this other stuff. You need to understand the structure of the folders here. So it's the session folder, and inside of the session folder is the session file and all of these ancillary folders. These folders are preset to receive assets as Pro Tools makes them. If Pro Tools doesn't make them, the assets, they will remain empty. If I click on this, it's empty, right? There's nothing in there because I haven't added any audio to my Pro Tools session. There's no bounced files, there's no clip groups, there's no video files, there's nothing. So watch what happens if I take this and I close the session. And let me show you another key command here. Key commands are really important. So if you want to close a session but not quit Pro Tools, you can simply navigate up here and go close session. But if you notice, and this is something that you all should get into, is learning your key commands. They're right here. So for, to close the session but not um, quit Pro Tools, it's Command, Shift, and the letter W. And it will give, ask you if you want to save. I will say yes. And then notice all of those folders that are inside of here, they disappeared. All you have is the session folder and the session file. The reason that they disappeared is that there's no assets in them. Let me go into my project drive and let me show you. Um, right? So this is a, another project. You'll notice that there are session backup files and there are audio files. There are lots of audio files because this is a mixed session that only has audio files in it. And they got put into that folder. And if you were to just send me, notice, look at them all, right? There's 50 or 60 audio files in there. If you were to send me this session file on my computer, to look at as your assignment, and you've got audio files in your session folder, it won't work on my computer. Because Pro Tools will be looking for the assets in this audio files, and you didn't send them. You only sent me this. So you would have to uh, send this, the entire session folder. So that's very important to understand, and I think that's the most I've actually explained 
that's the most clearly that I've, that's the clearest I've explained it, I think, in my 10 years of teaching, but it's always, so... Uh, sure, Max. I don't understand why it won't let you set it to 44.1. Um, but yes, 48 is fine. I can open, I won't have a problem with that. Thanks. Yep, not a problem. Troy, uh, don't worry about that. Not a problem. Yeah, and you guys know that I, um, for, until I get home in a couple of weeks, that you guys are over there and my camera's here. You don't want to see what's on that side of the room. <laughs> this is at least fairly neat over here. Okay, so, um, yeah, all right. So, let's see. Okay, so let's open this up again. Now, some more setup stuff. We went over this once before, and this is contained, all, all what I'm about to show you is contained on those short Pro Tools uh, setup videos that's linked on that PDF that we went over at the beginning of the class. So we want to, if you've got a Mac, you need to set your Mac up so that certain key commands do not get in the way of you working on your Mac. Key commands are so important for any software, whether you're working in Lightroom, Photoshop, Adobe Premiere, DaVinci, uh, um, uh, the Apple's video editing software, whether you're working in Pro Tools, Logic, Word, anything. Key commands make you a ninja on the software. They make you fly, and it's almost like you're playing the computer like an instrument. And to be honest with you, that's a big thing that I've got. The computer is an instrument that you need to learn how to play if you want to succeed in the 21st century, right? I don't care who you are. Um, unless you're Keith Jarrett or, or Vladimir Horowitz or Midori or, or any like, you know, ace, like, you know, you're at the top, 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 right? You need to know music technology. And I'll give you a perfect example. Herbie Hancock, one of the greatest musicians of the past hundred years, one of the absolute greatest musicians the United States has ever produced. He is an expert with music technology and he always has been. And yet he's the, one of the greatest jazz pianists that's ever lived. He's an incredible composer. He's an incredible performer, arranger. He's an unbelievably great musician. And he is an expert. Uh, he could be teaching these classes no problem. So I always use him as an example because he's just unbelievable. Herbie. Okay. Let's set up our Mac. So I'm going to go to the Apple menu and I'm going to go to System Preferences. And this brings up my System Preferences and there's a couple of things that we need to turn off and set up. So the first thing is Spotlight. And I don't mean Spotlight on Wilson Pickett, but I mean Spotlight. And I'm going to go to Keyboard Shortcuts right here. And I'm going to click on Spotlight right here. I guess you could get there through Keyboard as well. And typically you guys have these turned on. Mac has these turned on by default. I'm going to turn these off. Okay, you want to have those off. So that's definite. Now, you'll notice that I've got an extended keyboard. All of you that are working on laptops do not have an extended keyboard. Having this numeric pad here for every software, this gives you extra functionality. But you can do everything with just this smaller keyboard. So if I start talking about this keyboard, because that's my habit, just simply remind me that you guys don't all don't have that. But if you've got like an iMac, uh, you'll have this most likely. Um, I even use one of these with my, when I work with my laptop, just because I'm so used, I'm so married to this here. It makes my life easier. But you can access all that here as well. So you're going to turn off... You're going to be really turned off by Spotlight. So just make sure that Show Spotlight Search is off and Show Finder Search Window is off. Now for the keyboard, let's, let's, uh, let's actually, let's, let's move back here. So we go back and let's go to our mouse. And you should all have your, ma your mouse, if you're using a Mac, if you're using a, uh, an, um, and if, you, if you're not using, if you're using it on your trackpad, you'll have to set up your trackpad to do this. Um, 
but you want the secondary click to click on the right side so you can right click on things. Okay, uh, there is, let's see. I have a trackpad hooked up, so secondary click would be to click with two fingers, all right? So when I say right click, if you're using a mouse pad, uh, I mean a, a, a trackpad, if you're using a trackpad like I've got here, right, I've got this set up to click with two fingers for a secondary click. Okay, and then um, I go to keyboard here. Yeah, so if I click keyboard here, right, you don't have to set this up now, but eventually I'm gonna ask you to set this up so that the F1, F2 are standard function keys. Now, if you wanna do, and if you've got one of the newer Mac Pro, Mac Minis that has the touch bar, uh, th that sucks, but um, you won't be able to do this. Uh, but if you do have an older one or you're using a, a an iMac or something like that with a regular keyboard or you use a regular keyboard with your laptop, I like to use these. They help me navigate around the toolbar. And if you want to use the functions, you hold down the FN key and it goes back to the regular functionality. So this one is optional, but it just means you, you'll be using your mouse more than the keyboard. Okay, now... More setup, all right? The stuff is like the first, this is, a, you know, this is dry. It's a little boring. It's not really creative, but setting things up like at the beginning really well will make your life easier as things get more evolved. And also learning how to set this thing up, you're learning the software so that if something screws up, you'll know how to set something back up the right way again or the way that I'm teaching you, which I think works well. It's not the only way, it's, but it's the way that I'm teaching you for the semester. When you get out of these classes, you can do whatever you want. Give me one sec here. Um, professor, I just have a question. Yep. Um, I'm trying to, it's Joseph's old. Um, I'm trying to save with command shift W, but every time I do that, it closes the program without saving. Right, because you've done nothing that needs to be saved. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that right, was clear. Okay, yeah. so when I do something, it would change. So let's say say you um, that's that's going to get me to when we start working. That's going to get me to you will have to save often. You can turn on auto save in Pro Tools. I'll show you how to do that. I don't have auto save turned on because I typically work with a piece of software called Contact, and it sometimes if I'm playing something back and auto save is on, it saves all of the samples that I've got loaded into Contact, which might be. 40 or 50 or 60 gigabytes worth of samples or maybe more and it can cause Pro Tools to crash. So I just manually save constantly but I will show you how to set up autosave um, and how to access that. So th that'll help you out. But if you do some, if you save and then you do some work and then you do Command Shift W, it will say, do you want to save before you close the session? And then you could say yes. But if you haven't done All right, anything- All right, thank that, you. Right, if you haven't I guess done, it just closed it. All right, thank you. Yeah, it just closed the session, not the program, because the program is still active. So that's something that you just learned the difference of. And it's not a big deal. You, you'll learn the stuff. It's, you know, it's, it's questions you need to ask because somebody else might have the same question. So thank you for asking that. So let's go to the setup again menu here. And we're going to scroll down to the bottom to pref... Oops, sorry, one second. I caught that before you... And if I am on my face and I'm talking about the screen, please speak up and interrupt me. So we're gonna to go to setup and we're gonna to go to preferences, which is the bottom option. And we're gonna look at uh, three different, I think three different tabs here. You notice that this is Pro, Pro Tools. I have Pro Tools Ultimate. You don't have to need, you don't need that. It'll just say Pro Tools Preferences. And notice across the top here, there are all these tabs. These are different pages. So we're gonna stay on the, 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 the display page the blah, blah, blah. yeah i'm articulate not so remember how when i was hovering over something it was telling you what it was those are tool tips you want the function and the details turned on i like to organize my plugin menus by category and manufacturer okay i'll show you why later uh in the newer versions of Pro Tools, you've got different kinds of themes. 
for right now, just stick with classic. As you get used to this, you can play around with the, the dark theme and changing, you know, customizing the way Pro Tools looks for the way you want. And then over here on the right side of this are some important things for me. In the color coding area, notice how this is broken up into three different little sub areas. You got the basics, warnings and dialogues and color coding over here. So this is the way I want color coding set up. And I'm going to make a screenshot of this and pop it in. Give me one second to... Um, Let me just rename this. Okay, great. Let me pop that in the chat. You guys can download that and you can have it as a reference. Oh, Troy, I'm on a direct message with Troy. Hold on. Great, let me get that again. Oh. Here we go. And now you guys all have that. Okay, so let me, let's go over this and I'll explain. Okay, we always want to display marker colors. Remember when I had the markers of the memory locations? Every section had a different color. It's great for navigating. MIDI note color shows velocity. That's very helpful for editing MIDI notes. I like to have that on. Now, the default track color coding, I like to have it set for tracks and MIDI channels. There are different ways of doing this, but let's all do the same one. It works really well. So the track, we will have a track and a MIDI channel. We can have different colors for all those, for every track. But the important thing here is the default clip color coding is the same as the track. So that if your track is blue, all the clips in that track will be blue. And this is a great way for you to understand what instrument is playing what where if, if the tracks are all color coded like this. So default track color coding is tracks and MIDI channels. And the default clip color coding is the track color. A couple of other things. Operation. Auto backup. If you want to enable track, enable session file auto backup, you can have backup like every, you could set this up for five. You can keep the 20 most recent backups so that if Pro Tools crashes, maybe you've only lost five minutes worth of work. You can just turn that on if you want. I don't, I don't have it on. I've explained why. And then the last tab is MIDI, which is over here. And the most important thing <clears throat> here is automatically create click track in new session so that every session you open up has a click track. Now, there's an issue I have with Pro Tools is that these things change um, and sometimes you don't know why, but they change, all right? So you have to learn how to set them up again, uh, and it only takes a couple of seconds. So in other words, if I open up one of your sessions on my computer and you've got it, the, your preferences set up differently, your preferences will change my preferences. And then I can save a file to just reopen that file. It'll set all my, sensors, all my uh, preferences up correctly, but it only takes me 10 seconds to set them up because I don't use some of the advanced bits here. They don't really, um, I don't need these as much. They're mostly for like people that are doing heavy audio editing and mixing to film for films. So um, yeah, so MIDI automatically create click track for new sessions and then click OK. And then before you work, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to your setup. And now you're going to go to what's called I.O., right? And then remember I told you to set up your audio engine. Well, now you need to get your I.O. set up. And yours is going to look different than mine. And what you want to do is go to input and hit default, output and hit default, 
and then bus and hit default. And you see that I've got all of these here. These were from my last session, all these names that I named different things. If I hit default, those are all going to go away. See that? And this is the basic setup for my audio interface. So whatever you've got set up as your audio interface, whether it's a Scarlet or whether it's the internal audio interface, it will set up these for you the way that you need to, the basic setup for that um, choice. And then just hit OK. Now, for all of you, right, you for your first session, you're going to have to go to the track window and then go to the bottom and create a click track. And that will just, so if I were to delete this and go to track and create click track, boom, comes right back in. Okay? And notice how it's highlighted. To unhighlight the name, I just hit option and click on that. All right. So that's it. We're ready now to start working. Okay? So, um, let me think about this for a second. So in our OneDrive, homework materials for class two. There are three pieces by Bartok. We're going to download these, and I'm going to have to talk for a second um, to all of you, since we've got different, different levels. We've got multiple levels of students in the class. All right, and this assignment is going to take multiple weeks to finish, and we're going to go away from it for a little while and come back to it. Okay, so for all graduate students, for next week, you're going to get all these notes in, and I'm going to show you how to do this, on two tracks. Okay, so this is for graduate students. This is a violin duet, and you're going to use two pianos. And we're going to go over that. Just get all the notes in, and you're going to have to, this is going to teach you a lot. You have to change meters, right? Because it starts off in 3 4, then it goes to 2 4, 3 4, and, and a couple of more 2 4s. For those of you that are undergraduate students, if you can read music and you want to do that, you certainly can. There are these other bar talks that are much easier. There's this one. If you can't read music, what I've done here on number 18 is I've written the note names of every pitch and I show you how long these notes are. This is, you're in 4-4 four, four time. So this first note is one, two, and then these notes come in on three and four. And I made you all a piano notes map so that you can see, for example, let me, uh, make this a little bigger. So you see, you've got this clef here, which is called the G clef or the treble clef, which is right here. And you see that this note is on the second space from the bottom. So you go to the second space from the bottom, so it's an A, and then you look on the piano keyboard and it's it's between the second and third black note right here. And that's sort of in just above the middle section. You all have those 48 key keyboards if you got them from Justin. So it's, it typically defaults to right above where the middle the middle of the keyboard is. Right? So you can sort of you're going to have to figure just scuffle your way through and figure it out. This is very simple. And, you know, you, you just, what you'll do is a couple of, you know, like, a, um, you'll, you're going to break this up into multiple sessions and do a little bit each time. So hopefully this will all help you out. Let me make sure that that's up in the drive. Yeah, let me just drag this in here. There we go. So the piano notes are in there. All right. So this will be the only assignment, uh, well... There might be another one with notation. Let's see how it goes. But, you know, let's just, st you can start with this. This one's a little more challenging. If you guys can read music a little bit, I would suggest doing this one, which is number 17, right? And this one is number 18. And there, the numbers are written right next to it. So um, undergraduates, like I said, if you can do 
number number uh, 15, God bless you. If it's a little challenging for you, pick one of these two and just get the notes into Pro Tools on two piano tracks, right? One for the right hand and one for the left hand. So I'm going to work on that right now with you. So let me do, uh, graduate students, hold on a second and I'll get back to your piece in a second. So let's go to Pro Tools here and I'm going to make this smaller so that I can see the notation over here. And let me zoom in on this notation. So I'm going to do, I'll do the first line of this one here, and then I'll do the first line of the first two, three, four measures of this one here. So let's see. So it says a quarter note equals 120. That's our tempo right here, right? So on Pro Tools, you're already set up with your tempo at 120. So you don't have to change that. But let me show you a little secret, right? If it's too fast for you to play, what I want you to do is set up a preset tempo that's much slower and easier for you to play. So what do I mean by that? If we turn off the conductor track, I can type in something like 80. So if the conductor track is off, it's at 80 beats a minute. If the conductor track is on, it pops back up to 120. So you can play it in slower and listen back faster. So for, just for fun, I'm going to leave it at 80, even though I can play it at 120, it's not a problem. And I'm gonna make my count off one bar. So I'll get one, I'll get here four clicks, one, two, three, four, and start playing. If you wanna make it two bars, you can just change it here for two bars. And also, if you've got this highlighted here, make sure that count off only during record two bars is checked. All right, so we need to add an instrument, two instrument tracks, two pianos. So what I'm gonna do is go, uh, I'm gonna go to split screen. Now, now I'm gonna do command, shift, and N like Nancy. And that's gonna bring up a window. And we are going to get this new tracks little pop-up window. So create, and this tells us the number of tracks. So I'm going to type in the number two here. And then this next one here is very important. Two, new, we're defining what we want to add. You can add, you, you can add this plus and make columns and columns of different tracks in here, but we're just going to do this very simply. Every instrument track, Every instrument track is stereo, 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 stereo. Every instrument track is stereo, and please make sure you select instrument track. If you select audio track and you plug an instrument into it and you hit record, it's not going to play, all right? So if you don't get sound, most likely you've put in an audio track. That happens to a couple of people every semester, all right? Okay. So we are going to select to stereo instrument tracks, right? There are a lot of tracks in Pro Tools. We're gonna learn not all of these. We're gonna learn audio tracks, aux inputs, and uh, instrument tracks. We might learn VCA Master and Master Fader. I have to see how much stuff you guys get through. All right, so um, instrument track. So two stereo instrument tracks. This defaults to samples, leave it there. The name, we're not going to name it right now. You could just name it. Actually, let's see what happens if I name it piano. All right, so uh, I got a two. Put my two in there. It somehow disappeared. And boom, I've got two tracks that are pre-named piano. Piano one and piano two. So that worked out very well. That's perfect. If you don't do that, you have to double click here and name it. Because if I do that again, command shift N one, stereo, instrument track one more time one stereo instrument track notice how it comes named inst before you record always name your track before you record always name your track the track gets named before you record please get in that habit 
because what ends up happening is that your clips don't get names on them. And it's bad for organization. It's bad for knowing what you're looking at. So it can be fixed, but just get in the habit of naming your tracks what they're going to be. You don't have to name it as you're putting them in. You could go back. I could name this Piano 3 or Bass or whatever I want, and then it would become a bass track. Now, I'm going to get rid of that, and I'll show you how to delete these tracks at another point. But I've got two piano tracks here, right? So what I want to do is make sure that what we're seeing here in this area, I haven't gone over setting that up yet. So click here. And what you want to see is instrument inserts. You don't need to see sends for right now, so you could turn that off, get you some screen space. You probably don't need to see the I.O. If you want to turn that off, you can, but leave it on for right now because if you don't see something that looks like this with a left and a right at 100, it looks more like this, then you've made a mono instrument track and you need to redo it and make a stereo instrument track. So you don't, these are the, one, the bare minimum that you need to see. Instrument, inserts, I.O., and track color. What we're going to do is we're, notice the inserts has a column. And we can resize the track here, right, by clicking and dragging. Notice I hover. It changes to a cross. That happens in a lot of spaces in Pro Tools. And there are five slots or racks or whatever you want to call them in this insert. We're going to go to the top rack, and we're going to click on that. It's going to bring us a, men a menu. And we want to just do what I tell you to do here a multi-channel plugin. If you set this up properly, you will be able to go to Air Music Technology, and let me zoom out, and you're going to put in, you're going to scroll down to the word Mini Grand right here. Alternatively, if you haven't done that, you can go up here to the word Instrument. But you see, I've got hundreds of instruments in here, so I have to scroll way down. So, And then Mini Grand is also here. But you're going to go multi-channel instrument, and we set this up in preferences so that we have manufacturers for our plugins, right? And we're going to go over here, and we're going to just scroll down to Mini Grand, which is right here. And we're just going to click, and then you'll see a new GUI pop up. And this is our Mini Grand. This is our GUI for Mini Grand. Just load it in and leave the default for now. We'll get into customizing that in the future. And just if you want to make sure that it's sounding, just click on any of these notes. It should be sounding. And notice as I click on it, you're seeing level right here. Okay? Now, you want to have Mini Grand in the second one. Well, you can do that. You can go through that whole procedure again. But what I like to do, if it's going to be the same thing, is Option, Click, Drag. And it loads it in there as well. Option, Click, Drag. That's a standard Macintosh. And you can do the same thing on Windows functionality. All right? So I've got my keyboard here. USB is hooked into my computer, right? You all know that. If I start playing, I should hear some sound, right? No, no sound. Why not? Because we need to record enable the track, which is right here. So you click on the track record enable, and we're going to get a red bouncing ball. Boom, like that. Oh, I got to turn my keyboard on. Give me one second. Okay, here we go. Give me one second. Okay, so I've made a mistake here, right? And I did this mistake, not on purpose, but I did this mistake. So if I record enable this, nothing is happening. But you're hearing, you're seeing this line go. That's my microphone. So what I've done here is I've put in two instrument tracks. So it's good that I made that mistake so you'll see what a problem is. And you can look right here. And if you get this issue and you're not hearing anything, look here. It's looking like an audio wave. So that means that you've I've put two audio tracks in there. So I'm going to right-click 
and then scroll down to delete and they'll go away. So let me do that whole thing again, which is always good to see. So I'm going to do two stereo instrument tracks. All right. And I'm going to name this piano. Great. And now it's named the piano one and two. And now you'll notice that in the instrument column, there's information. And this is information that we're going to use in our creativity. So I'll go back here and I'll go put my mini grand back in. And then I can close. This will sound. So notice it still sounded when I clicked on the keyboard because an instrument track has audio and MIDI components. And I'll go over that in the future. And But when if I put that plug in the insert, the mini grand, it gets the audio component, but the mini grand plugin is not being triggered by MIDI because it's not, a, it doesn't have a MIDI component in audio track. So I'll go over that to clarify that in the future. So I'm going to option, click, drag this down here. And also these are both selected. So I'll just option click to unhighlight them. And if I click here, right? Beautiful, right? Get sound. Okay, let me scroll down back and let's let me play. I'll play this right here for you guys. Okay, so let me do this. So hit the return key so that you know that you're at bar one. Okay, and let's see. Let me move this up so you guys can see it on the screen. There we go. You can see everything on the screen now. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> okay. And make sure that, like, right now, I can't get Pro Tools to record because the PDF is active. It's the top layer. You can see right here, up here, it says Preview. But if I click on this, then Pro Tools becomes active. So I'm going to hit, to, to start recording, the key command for extended keyboard with the alphanumeric keypad is the number three over here but for you guys you're going to do command and spacebar and then what you're going to hear is four clicks and then I'll start then it'll start recording and remember I'm at manual tempo 80 I turned off my conductor track so I'm going to do command spacebar I'm going to count to four I'm going to get the tempo I'm going to feel the tempo and I'm going to start playing one two Three, four, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, off. Very simple. Now, I'm going to show you how to draw the notes in in a second, all right? But let's just do that for now. And then if I want to do the left hand, I'll hit record, return, make sure I'm at the, back at the beginning, and then I will record enable piano two. And then I'm going to record these, even though it's the same line an octave lower. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Oh, sorry, one more time. One, two, three. You know, I made a mistake the first time. Did I set that up for two bar counting? Yes, I set that up for two bar counting. I never use a two bar counting. Okay, let me do the top line again. I can just delete that. And let's do that again. And Okay, return, command, spacebar. Two, four, one, two, three, four. Very simple. Hit the return key, record enable piano two, two, three, four, four, two, three, one. Okay, and the first line is done, right? So now let me show you um, undergrads, and I'm going to get on to the graduate in a minute. 
if you can't figure that out, right? Let me delete this. Oh, before I go on. So I finished up to the first four bars, right? But there's another four bars to this. So if I want to start here, that's at measure five, right? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, it's measure at six right here. So I can either type in six up here or I can put the playback head right here at six, right? If, well, we got to be in grid mode up to six. And then I can do the same thing. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, right? And it picks up from there. Three, four. And then I can do the same thing with the right hand. And that's the same thing if you make a mistake. So let's say you can only get the first, you can do this, you can record measure one, get that correct, then start at measure two and record these two notes, start at measure three and record these two notes. You don't have to play all four notes, you don't have to play all through the whole bit. You can do this measure by measure, you can even do it note by note. So let me show you what I mean by that, right? So I'm showing you techniques, if you can't play keyboards, how you can get this information into the computer, all right? So let's do piano one, and I'm just gonna do the first two beats, all right? And I'm gonna change my count off to one one bar because I don't feel like waiting for two, counting two bars. Okay, so I'm just gonna play the first note, all right? One, two, three, four, one, two, off, right? Okay, so this is on bar one, beat three. One, two, three, right here. So I'm um, bar one, beat three, okay? And I'm gonna, it'll give you four clicks, and then I'm just gonna play the G. One, two, three, four, one, off. Oh, oh, interesting. Okay, so now I just learned something which I never learned knew before. It will give you four beat count in, but then it'll go beat one, beat two of this measure, and then you would come in on beat three. So well, I'll, I'll give you the count in. So four, three, two, one, one, two, in. Right? And then beat four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, right? And then I've just put in the first four bars. I can't play keyboards and I just got all those in, right? So that's, and you could just go through the whole bit like that. And then the way that you would get it to be a nice performance is through editing. And we're going to learn how to edit. So I can't expect everybody to have advanced, all the MAP students to have advanced keyboard skills or even basic keyboard skills, but you need to learn how to input data on the keyboard. So you can do it one note at a time, you could do it one measure at a time, and you can just get the whole thing through, you know, and, and you can just break it up. So like today, I'm just gonna spend 20 minutes and I'm gonna get the first, I'm gonna get the, um, the first, line of the right hand and then I'm going to spend 20 minutes tomorrow I'll get the second line of the right left hand the first line of the left hand then the next day I'll start at measure seven and I'll go through and I'll get the right hand and then the fourth day I'll do this so basically you would spend four or five 20 minute sessions over the next week you'll do a little bit at a time and you'll get the whole thing done and make sure you're constantly um, saving okay now before I, I'm going to spend half an hour going over the graduate project, which will contain information that all of you will learn, should learn anyway. But I've done this, right? So I'm going to close this out and make sure that everything is not selected and do Command, Shift, and W like Wilson. Save. And I'm going to go here, right? Oh, that's Recording Studio Fundamentals. Let's see. We are here. And let's say that I was going to hand this in next week, right? I'm going to open this up. You are, make sure the folder is closed, all right? Make sure the session folder is closed. If it's open like this, close it. And then take the folder and right click on the folder and compress that. So you really need to learn to get in the habit of sending things compressed over the internet, all right? That keeps everything bundled up. And this is what you would drag into here. And there you go.
Now, additionally, you need to have an online storage space. If you've got a Gmail address, you have, I don't know, 15 gigabytes of free storage. If you've got uh, Dropbox has a free two gigabytes worth of storage, you should sign up for one of these services and you should every day at the end of your workday, you should have a folder in there for your projects, save them up there. Things really need to be in three places at once. I'm always backing up. I always have you know my, my projects folder on my computer and I always typically at home and even here, right? You see, I've got an external, a little external drive with a cable on it that I back up to often. And for example, let me just show you something. I came down here to work and before I came down here to work, I uploaded every file, every session for this film I'm working on now, all the music I had done, and I had to redo one of the cues, and somehow it disappeared from my hard drive, but I had the backup here. So I was able to just download it, and I know I have it on in a hard drives up at my house, but I didn't store it on a, a portable drive down here, but I did upload it onto my Dropbox, so it kind of saved my bacon last week, right? So... And notice how I am consistent about my naming here. I'm telling you to do stuff that I do. Notice that this is the same bit. Okay, so save, save, save. Okay, good. And that's how you would upload. Let's do our last half hour on the graduate project. So uh, Pro Tools, Command N, uh, Command N. And this is uh, Bartok. This is, I think this is 15, is that what it is? Bartok 15, so I'm just gonna write Bartok uh, 15. Oops, not 125, 15. And then 10, 22, uh, 10, uh, 2, 10, 22, and my initials. Okay, uh, we need my underscore. And then, and, and there's a reason why I don't leave spaces and I do underscores. And when you guys, if you guys take Audio MIDI 2 and you learn how to program a sampler, this is the way a sampler finds and, and assigns things properly, is this kind of naming convention. So I've just adopted it. So I'm going to create this, and this will be Bartok 15. Now, I'm going to do Command Shift N, and there will be two stereo instrument tracks piano I'll name it and we're going to make this into a full blown arrangement so don't worry about it guys you're just and girls ladies you're just going to you're just going to start working with this as it is now and then as we expand this out into a bigger arrangement we'll learn editing techniques copying and pasting and a bunch of stuff to make this into a really nice arrangement of this piece so Remember I said that there are time signature changes in this and it's a different tempo. So we need to set all that stuff up before we start working. So this is at 80 beats a minute. To assign a tempo, you go to your tempo ruler. Make sure that you've hit return and you're back at measure one. And this is your tempo ruler. And notice here there's a little plus sign. Click on that plus sign, you see it says Add tempo change. So I'm going to click on that and another little menu is going to pop up. And this gives you a bunch of information. Your location right at the beginning of the piece. Bar 1, beat 1. Your beat PM and then snap to bar which means that no matter what numbers in here it'll put it to the beginning of the bar. So that's 80 beats per minute. And then the resolution. Well it's a quarter note right. So we want our, our so if we want it 6-8 uh, we would have our, we might have a dotted quarter note uh, to be our click track, you know, or, or whatever the tempo. So we would just, we're doing quarter notes here. Okay. And 
and why is that not changing? Oh, here we go. Okay, great. So I just learned something new. All right. You have to turn the count off. Off. See, I'm always learning stuff new with this stupid uh, program. So I turn the count off, off and I hit 80 at measure one and boom. There, we're now at 80 beats a minute. Okay. Now, the other thing about this is that there's tempo, different tempo. It says time signatures. So we're in three, four, and then we've got a bunch of two fours. So We've got three, four at bar one, two, three, four, five. And at bar six, we've got two, four. And at bar seven, three, four. Before you start playing, set up your tempo and time signature map, right? So one is three, four. So I click on the plus by the word meet on meter. Bar one is three, four. Hit enter. And you notice that we're now in three, four time. And then let's go here. And it's, I thought it was, so one, two, three, four, five, a measure six. We go to two, four. So I just click on six here, hit our tempo thingy. and Oh, not tempo, time signature. And that becomes two, four. And then at measure seven, it goes back to three, four, correct? Yep. So let's do that. Hit our meter. Now, there's a real cool, you can keep going all the way through that, right? But what you can also do, which is kind of cool, is that you notice that every time there's a 2-4 bar, there's also a 3-4 bar that follows it. So we've got 3-4 at measure 7, 8, 9, measure 10 is 2-4, and 11 is 3-4. So 10 is 2-4, and 11 is 3-4. So if I, it's easiest if you set up the selector tool, right? And I go here and I click and I drag these. See how these two measures are now selected? The 2, 4, and the 3, 4. I can copy those, which is Command C. And then I can zoom out. And I can click on measure 10 right on that ruler and paste the Command V. Paste that in. See that? It just goes right in. It's a beautiful thing. And then, so go through the whole piece, right? Before you start playing, go through the whole piece and get the tempo map done. And double check it. Make sure it's correct, all right? If you want to print out the music because it's easier for you, do that and write the measure numbers in. You know, there should be measure numbers on every measure of, of, of music if you're recording. But that's another story that we get into in uh, Recording Studio fun, uh, Audio Mini 2. But... Set up your tempo, your, your meter map first, okay? And your tempo. And then now let's start recording, right? Now, I'm going to show you something a little advanced that will help you out. So I'm just going to play here the top line, and then I'm going to add the second line, and then I'm going to add the left hand. And we'll just do the first... I'll go through, I can play this all, but let's, I'll go through it two measures at a time. All right. So I'm going to play bop, 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 right? That's what I'm going to play. And then I'm going to play bop, bop. So let me get this set up so that we can see both. And see, I have two monitors. So if I was doing this, I'd have this on a second monitor. If you've got like an iPad, um, you can use your, your iPad, that helps, or you can just print it out. You can look at it. Okay, so I'm going to go back, hit return, and I need to uh, count off one bar is set up. Great. So I'm just going to do bop, 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 right? And make sure you get your rests correctly, although we can edit that later. So one, two, three. Oh, would be helpful if I had a piano in there, right? <laughs> Okie doke. Here we go. And if you've played something in, you don't have to worry. You can double click on that and delete it, or you can just record over it. So I just deleted it. That's fine. Okay, so command. 
Command spacebar, one, two, three. Off. Now, I want to record measure two, a beat two, a half note, and another half note. Now, if you can play, do that, no problem. But if you can't do that, you don't play keyboards well enough to do that, there are solutions. And the solution is found right here in this little control here called MIDI Merge, right here. So I'm going to click on that. And re always remember that when this is on, you will um, always record and not erase the MIDI that was previously recorded. So that's you got to be careful that you use that, you have that on when you need to use it. So basically what's going to happen is I'm going to start from the beginning and I'm going to go one, two, three, one, two, off. All right, so let's... So three, three beats up front, and then I come in on beat two with that D. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And now let's do the left hand. Now, don't worry about the phrasing. Just get, just get the notes in. I want to teach you how to edit and get the phrasing in. If you can play the phrasing in, it's always better to play it in nicely, but you do but if you can't play it in nicely, you need to learn how to shape the music inside of the software. And we will definitely be working on that. So I'm gonna play the first two measures with my left hand. One, two, three. So I didn't like that. I played it badly. So if I want to get rid of what's there, I would use Command Z and notice how it disappears. And I would do it again. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Right? And my rhythm is a little bit sloppy. Do the best you can with rhythm. I'm going to teach you how to fix, clean that up when we edit. So just do the best you can. Try to get the best performance you can play in. But if the rhythms are a little bit off, don't worry about that. I won't take off on your grade because you're going to learn how to fix that. That'll be part two. All right. So. And we'll also learn how to change tempo. So in other words, there's an alleg allegrando at the end here, which is like a slowing down. I'll teach you how to draw that in so that we can get a nice rallentando there. And we'll work on dynamics. We'll work on all sorts of stuff. But you basically want to get through this piece for next week. So let me talk to you all about how I want you to, habits I want you to get in. When you, like I've said here that learning how to do this is like learning how to play an instrument. All right. Yes, Noam, that works also. I, I, I guess Ken must have taught you that last semester. Is that correct? Yeah, I did it with Ken. Yeah. So anything that Ken taught you, I'm, I'm good with that. All right. Ken is awesome. And, you know, I taught him a lot about the MIDI. So he's do, he did stuff that I work with. He is an incredible audio engineer. And you guys were all very fortunate to have studied with him. I wish I had taken audio engineering with him. Well, I did, but not at a class because we both had a, a rooms in a studio together and I learned a lot from him about recording instruments. So that is another, definitely another way that Norm wrote in there, but that's a little bit more advanced, which requires a different window. And so I'm trying to do everything right now inside the edit window and then we'll move over to other functionality. So this is how I want you to work. So if you're going to play, learn how to play an instrument, is it better to t play for eight hours one day or is it better to play for 45 minutes a day for eight days? 45 minutes for eight days. Right, because the repetition and the time between sessions is very important. The time between sessions gives the thing that you've practiced, it gives it space to seep into your subconscious and to get deeper into into. Into, into yourself, right? That's the best way I can describe it. And then the repetition, right, reinforces what you've learned and you'll get a little better at it. So 
it's better to not wait until next Wednesday night to try to get this done. What I want you to try to do for the entire semester is schedule in several sessions. Just put it in your schedule, three or four, and I don't want you to work more than two hours a week. So if, if we've got a three, like, you know, three credit class, two hours worth of homework a week is not, I don't think that that's too much to ask. Um, when I was an undergraduate, Professor Berkowitz had me uh, had learn to, at Queens College, had me learn to play the F minor uh, Chopin etude, which is an F minor, and transpose it to C minor in one week, right? Yeah, and I wasn't a classical pianist, and I did it. Um, that was more than two hours worth of work. That was probably like 20 hours worth of work to stumble through it for class, but I did get through it. Um, you know, and he would give us a week to write a fugue, to, you know, but that, that took 10 hours to do. But I think that I want you to stay interested in this. You've got, this is an elective class for many of you. For some of you, it's a minor. And I want to keep you interested. I don't want to overburden you with work. I want to make sure that you do enough work so that you're growing and learning, but not so much work that you get frustrated with it because this can be very frustrating study. All right. It can be, it can really turn you off the technology. And I, there's been times when I've ready to throw my uh, computer into the, into the, into the Hudson River. Right. So I want you to schedule out. So if you're going to do three 30 minute sessions, uh, four 30 minute sessions, maybe, you know, something like that, or three 40 minute sessions, just put it in your schedule. And you're going to have a specific goal to accomplish at every session. And maybe for this first week, you might do two and a half hours, you may take a half an hour, and just do the setup, all the preferences, and setting up your computer, and all setting up the way that Pro Tools looks because once you set up the way that Pro Tools looks where you're hiding certain things and only show every time you open it up it should open up the same with that what you've saved because that gets into your preferences and Pro Tools will open up hopefully the same way every time so maybe there's 30 minutes where you do that for the first week and then then two hours worth of work on the project so I want you to make small achievable goals Right, so that you can feel like you've made a victory every day. You've accomplished something, and you add those victories together, and that's how you that's how you do things. Right? Um, you don't look at the mountain and and like you're all the way at the top. You look at the mountain and you work the first hundred feet, and then you walk the second hundred feet, and you put enough one hundred feet to get. Like I I ran the New York City Marathon. And I used to do 10K races all the time. And when I ran the New York City Marathon, you know, that's 26 miles and 385 yards, right? That's a lot of running. I'd never run that far. My longest training run, they don't want you to run, at least when I ran it, they don't want you to run the whole length. The longest training run I did was 21 miles uh, about three weeks before the marathon. But when I ran the marathon, I didn't run 26 miles. I ran one mile 26 times because I could always run a mile. That's not a problem, right? I ran a mile, then I ran the next mile and you know, and you can break it down even further than that. I could tell you a whole story which maybe I'll do at some point in the future of this class where I learned that technique and how it sort of got me through an incredibly difficult period of time. Um, but so... You, you figure out what you want to do and you set out to do it. So for example, if you're a MAP student and you can't play keyboards well, well, you're going to do the, you're going to do the setup one day. The next day you're going to spend a half an hour and you do the right hand for the first line. Then the next day you'll do the left hand for the first line. Then the next session you do the right hand for the second line. And then the final session you'll do the right hand for the last, the, the bottom, the, the left hand for the last line. And at the beginning of each session, double check your work. Take a listen, look at, the, look at it, and make sure you've done it correctly. So you always want to be double checking your work. You want to make sure you're saving constantly in case Pro Tools crashes. You won't lose a lot of work. You will have auto save, but just get in the habit of doing that and upload your work. Get it out of your computer in case your computer crashes. No, no the dog ate my homework excuse, right? So if you're going to be doing this, this the violin duet, well, you know, the first day you're going to set up the, you're going to do the preferences and set up Pro Tools and maybe you'll make the 
you'll get the tempo set up. You'll get the click the uh, the tempo, and then you'll put your time signature changes in. The next day before you start to work, double check your time signature changes, right? And then maybe you'll do the first day, you'll do the first two lines of the right hand. And then the second day, you'll do the second two lines of the right hand. And then the third day, you'll do the first two lines of the left hand. And the fourth day, you'll do the second, the last two lines of the left hand. See how you've broken it up into small bite-sized chunks, you're spending a half an hour or maybe three 40-minute sessions, and you're accomplishing something every day. And then <clears throat> you get back to it. This is how I work, right? I have a film to score. I'm writing two minutes today. I have to I have to start, and by noon I have to be done with the first minute and take a break for lunch, walk the dog, come back, and then by five o'clock I need to be done with the second minute, right? Or w whatever. I try to set achievable goals that I can get to and not make them so easy that they're not challenging, but not make them so overwhelming that I get frustrated and, and walk away. So that's how I want you to work the whole semester, right? I want you to put several slots a week in and schedule it out. Try to find that time. It's much better than waiting till Wednesday night and trying to get everything done because you're not going to learn anything that way. So um, any questions on any of this? I'll get the... the uh, yes. Oh, yeah. I have uh, two questions. The first one... Um, with the the bar talk piece for the grad students so um i saw that there was dynamic markings in the piece do you want us to uh, address those if you if you want to you can but don't worry about it i'm going to be teaching you how to do that in midi editing but if you want to play it in like that be my guest you know the better your performance the easier the edi editing will be right <laughs> okay and then the second one um when we do submit work is it, are you also going to be like showing people's work during class? No, um, no, you, only, no, okay. only uh, I, I do that. Like, you know, in my film scoring class, I might sh at the end of the semester, I'll show some stuff, but I give you private feed. I give you like a, a five to 10 minute feedback video, which is a private lesson. And I, I did, I mentioned that at the beginning of the class, right? Yeah. 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 If there's a problem that everybody's happen having, I'm going to, I'll bring it up and I'll show something about that. But typically, I don't show other people's work during the class. We've got such a wide range of students that, um, you know, it, it might get a little, it's, 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 it's not, I don't think it's a good idea, you know, because some of you are graduate students and I've had, and I, Max is a very good violinist, uh, Maxfield, he's a very good violinist and, um, you know, he's a very accomplished musician and as are the grad students and the undergraduate students, they're just learning how to, some of them are just learning how to play an instrument. So, you know, it gets to be a little bit dicey and I don't want people to be comparing themselves and why can't I do what this person's doing and any of that crap. I just want you guys to just focus mm. in on what you're doing and I will individually go over your projects and give you, you know, advice. And we're going to take this piece and we're going to expand it out, okay? And, and it's going to be a multi-week project. There's going to be an interruption in the middle and the last thing we're going to talk about today is that. Um, so also, I, I, there's a, the, I put the videos up within a day or two, the feedback video, uh, the review videos, they get up and they look better and sound better than, than Zoom. So there will be no in-person class on the 24th. So there's an in-person class next week. There will be no in-person class on the 24th. All right. So you're going to work on the bar talk this week. You're going to hand it in next week. I'm going to give you some feedback. You're going to wait with it until we'll, we'll pick it up again on the 3rd. There will be an online project. There'll be two videos for you to watch. They're about an hour and f f half for the two of them combined, and there'll be an assignment based on those two videos. Um, <clears throat> I'll be traveling back to New York. I'll be leaving on the 25th. I'll be packing up my, my computer here. will be offline on the 24th. And I will be back on um, Sunday the 27th. And then we will pick up on the 3rd. So you'll hand in this week's assignment. There'll be an, I'll, I'll be putting a PDF, sending it to everybody with what the class on the 24th would have been. And you're going to watch those two videos and you're going to write an assignment that will be on a PDF and you'll hand that in on the 3rd, and then we'll pick up with the bar talk on the 10th. Okay, everyone. 
Um, a lot, a lot of information. A lot of information. But we got to get started. You got to get started somewhere uh, and uh, get started and just have a whack at it. You know, just do your best. Have a go, as the English would say.